Good day to everyone that's checked into this wonderful event from all around the world. And I see people have joined from Ecuador, from Zambia, from Australia, and uh, across the hemispheres. We're absolutely delighted today at the Oxford Martin School to welcome uh, Kristalina Gorgieva, the Managing Director of the IMF. Kristalina has been absolutely in the driving seat of attempts to respond to the pandemic, to ensure that developing countries can meet their ambitions. And I've been privileged over many years to know her. We were colleagues at the World Bank together, both vice presidents there. She then went on to have a stellar career at the European Commissioner as commissioner, uh, then as the chief executive of the World Bank for three years, a role that was created specifically for her uh, to manage the huge World Bank group. And also it was interim president of the World Bank before uh, wisely being tapped to be the managing director uh, of the IMF. And in that role now, finding herself at the fire station that is trying to deal with the raging fires around the world as the commander in chief, a massive task. And Christina, thank you so much for finding time in your extremely busy schedule uh, to spend this hour with us. We're going to chat for about 40 minutes and then we will open the conversation uh, to questions and answers. So please do post your questions uh, in the button at the bottom of the screen. Um, and uh, I hope we get to them. There's also a voting system which will allow you to vote for which questions you want to get behind, and I'll select those uh, that get the most votes. Uh, this is being recorded, so be aware of that. And for those of you that have friends that wanted to be part of this conversation uh, but couldn't be, uh, that recording will be available on our websites uh, following this event. So, Kristalina, I know today, uh, every day is an important and big day at the fund, but today you've uh, released a, a brand new report uh, which is, discusses how countries can finance the SDGs, how the pandemic has uh, affected them to the extent it's thrown them off course. And I thought it would be useful to begin this conversation by perhaps you saying something about what this report tells us and where we need to go with the findings. Uh, Ian, it is great to be with you and with the audience uh, that you have assembled. Uh, thank you for the outreach uh, capacity that you offer to us at the Fund to talk about this. The uh, new report we put out, the post-pandemic assessment of the sustainable development uh, goals, and to talk about uh, uh, broadly um, the uh, very important time we find ourselves uh, in. Uh, starting from the sustainable development uh, goals, uh, the reason we have focused on what is happening with the ability of countries to follow on their development path is uh, really sobering. It is the dangerous divergence in the economic fortunes between advanced economies, the richer countries, and the developing world, especially problematic for low-income countries. What we have seen in this pandemic is that three factors determine how countries cope. One, pre-existing conditions, countries with strong fundamentals, sound bu buffers, entered the crisis in better shape with more diverse economies, not dependent only on tourism. Second, the ability to mobilize policy support on scale through monetary and fiscal measures. And third, the ability to tap into the creativity of our scientists that have delivered vaccines in record short time. So what the fund has spoken loudly during especially our spring meetings is that the fortunes of countries are being determined by these three factors in a way that can dangerously undermine progress in development and actually affect global security down the road as a result. Advanced economies had been able to deploy 27% of GDP 
in monetary and fiscal policy measures, emerging markets 6%, low income countries 2% of a very small uh, GDP. And uh, now with uh, vaccinations uh, clearly advancing uh, more in the countries that have been able to afford massively to scale up vaccinations, uh, we see that risk of countries falling behind uh, becoming even uh, worse. I should add that this divergence happens also within countries. But the topic of our conversation today is the danger of divergence across countries. So we asked a very uh, uh, sober and straightforward question in this, uh, in this paper. What is happening with the pathway to reaching uh, the SDGs? And uh, uh, the answer is uh, uh, threefold. One, not surprisingly, countries are falling behind on their plans. We looked at four countries in details. Uh, com they, they, are, they are actually good representation of, of the world. Cambodia, Rwanda, Nigeria, and Pakistan. And uh, the analysis of these countries uh, tells us that COVID-19 is going to up the demand for resources quite significantly by on average two and a half percentage of GDP. So what was expensive to begin with in relative terms is now even more so. So the, on average, the, the percentage share that countries have to invest uh, has gone to 14% of GDP. And of course, it differs in some countries, it is more than, than in others. Uh, we looked at the five, um, let's call them investment opportunities uh, that are rel very relevant for, uh, for SDGs. We looked at education, health, roads, electricity, water and sanitation. Admittedly, this is, doesn't cover the whole um, uh, investment needs for SDGs, but it covers the biggest uh, chunk, and uh, we have uh, registered the uh, unf unfortunately the the impact being uh, one that uh, uh, absolutely requires extraordinary efforts to overcome this slowdown. So that is our second point that countries themselves now have to see what more they can do. And this is the uh, biggest value of our research. It offers a framework to assess policy options that countries can apply so they can cope better with the burden COVID-19 imposed on them, as well as the broader demands for accelerating a progress towards the SDGs. And when we when we place this uh, framework, you wouldn't be surprised. It is uh, it has it has shown that there are th more things ca countries can do on the policy uh, front, and they should take COVID nineteen as an opportunity to speed up actions that they were uh, embracing to begin with. Uh, and among those actions, uh, what we are keen to uh, to see. Uh, are things like prioritizing uh, fiscal revenues, reduce tax avoidance, increase the share of tax revenues. Uh, and I want to say, when I, when I read the paper, what impressed me was the example of Cambodia. Cambodia in, uh, has managed to eradicate uh, uh, poverty and it has done it with very determined uh, domestic policy and wise use of money. But big component of it was that they increased tax to GDP from under 10% to 25% and then improved the quality of spending. And that is the second area. Uh, we know there is waste in public um, uh, spending. Policies that reduce this waste are absolutely uh, critical. And then of course, making it so that domestic private sector and also foreign investments can find a more fertile uh, ground. So not a very um, 
um, um, innovative thing to say, but, but truthful that focus on fundamentals. And there we particularly emphasize investing in people, in education, in health, in social protection. We know educational attainment got a big dent uh, from COVID. We know that 40% of learners, and they are mostly in the developing world, have missed on almost a year of studies. We know that one extra year of studies lifts up wages by 10%. It's a big hit. So getting from this crisis an even more determined action to invest in people in the most important resource of the future. And then look at infrastructure needs, public infrastructure, private participation in, in infrastructure. And there again, uh, the study shows a very interesting example from Rwanda that started with practically zero investments in infrastructure and then working it with the World Bank managed to put public private um, uh, partnership capacity to bring both public money to a higher use and private uh, investments in infrastructure. Uh, finally, the third uh, conclusion uh, is something that resonates uh, very much uh, uh, with your own work. Uh, and uh, if I may, I'm going to do a bit of a, a promotion of your forthcoming uh, book, Rescue. And it is extra ordinary efforts on the international front. We need radicalization of cooperation because if we don't have a step up of what the world does to stop and reverse this dangerous divergence, countries simply won't be able to stay on course with the SDGs. And we do some calculations by how many years they will be pushed into the future if the world is um, too modest in doing its part. Uh, I want to uh, finish uh, with uh, an advertisement for a web page we are putting out, SDGs slash finance uh, on the IMF's uh, web uh, uh, page. You will find the paper and a lot of background materials there uh, but we are also going to populate it in the future with the framework itself. It allows different country data to be entered and then to look into what does it mean for the immediate policies and for longer term uh, policy uh, choices. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I will finish by saying we recognize that we need to, we ourselves, the fund, we need to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, we have done that in the first phase of the crisis. We provided financial lifelines to 86 countries. 52 of them are low-income countries. In Africa, for example, we have provided 13 times the equivalent of our average lending in the previous decade. In other words, in one year, we have done more than we have done uh, in a decade before. And we are now working with our board to increase access levels so we can continue to be a reliable uh, source of uh, finance, financing on concessional terms for low-income countries. We have provided debt relief, uh, in other words, grants to countries to pay what is due to the fund over so far 18 months, likely to extend it to uh, two years. And uh, our board, our, our uh, membership has granted us the, the, uh, the task of uh, issuing $650 billion equivalent in SDRs, new SDR allocation. It would lift up reserves everywhere for low-income countries. This is $21 billion of additional reserves at the time they saw so much needed. So let me stop with this. Uh, yeah, we'll come back to, to many of uh, these things. But I think what you've highlighted is that extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures, both domestically 
uh, and internationally. And um, your paper really helps us in, in focusing on the financing dimension of that. And we've also included a link to your new paper, I see, uh, on the on the, this webcast. So any, anyone participating will be able to click through uh, on that. And um, it certainly does seem like a time where, unless we do things differently domestically and uh, internationally, we'll fall further and further behind. And as you say, that, that, that certainly is, is my message in, in Rescue um, too. When we look at the international environment, uh, I mean, I, I read in your paper that the SDGs are likely to be set back by five to 10 years unless urgent action is undertaken. Uh, we see the rich countries uh, are, have mobilized about $16 trillion for themselves. Um, and as you've indicated, uh, massive increases in their deficits and debt. Um, yet the poorest countries have not been able to do that. Do you feel that your new SDR um, proposal can go some of the way to achieve that? And, and could you explain a bit? Um, maybe perhaps, perhaps not all uh, participants know what SDRs are. So maybe begin by, by explaining what SDRs are and why this is important and, and how almost free money can be created uh, by the IMF um, and perhaps recycled uh, to those most in need. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, yes, well, thank you uh, very much for giving me a chance to, to do a 101 on SDRs. Uh, uh, but before that, let me say that uh, the advanced economies doing better, growing faster, it does have spillover, positive spillover impact for the rest of the world. Uh, we now see how the US and China turning into these powerful engines of growth are lifting up uh, the world economy. But it is not enough on its own, especially for those countries that may not be connected uh, through um, supply chains or uh, trade uh, with these big, powerful uh, engines of the world economy. So we do need to do more. Uh, and uh, the special drawing rights are an instrument invented for this type of a crisis. Why? What is it? Uh, it is a reserve asset that the IMF can create on the strength of all 190 members. In other words, we have members with very strong currencies and we take four of those strong currencies, we put them in a basket and then with the uh, author authorization of the membership, 85% of the members to say yes do it we can issue reserves and distribute them across all our members in proportion to their quotas we have done that in the past most recently 2009 because of the global financial crisis at that time we allocated 250 billion dollars as part of a global effort to lift up confidence. This time, as you notice, we are going much further. Why? Because we are dealing with a much more dramatic global crisis. And uh, uh, as we allocate the SDRs, uh, which I hope would be done by, by the end of August, what it would do for a country that, that has melted its uh, reserves to pay doctors and nurses and protect people and vulnerable parts of the economy, their reserves would go up with this allocation. So what they have on top as dollars or other uh, reserve currencies becomes more easily available. In other words, it gives more space, more fiscal space for action. When countries have better reserves, they can borrow cheaper. And that is, the, that is why the membership uh, authorized us to do it. A second important part of using SDRs is that the well-off members, those that don't need injection of reserves, could voluntarily offer to on lend them on highly concessional terms the interest rate right now uh, on SDRs is 0.05%. Uh, 
um, so five uh, uh, BIPs, they can only lend them to countries that need them. And we have some experience in this crisis with that. We have done exactly that. Last April, I turned to the membership and I said, we need to triple concessional finance so we can help vulnerable countries. And two thirds of what we have received were SDRs from, from sound countries on land to the fund to help the membership. And so that, this gives us confidence that this option can also be explored. But first things first, let's get the SDRs, allocate them to members, and then we would see whether we can do a second bite of the SDR apple. And, and that will both things obviously vital. You can't do the second unless you've got the first. Uh, yes. But assuming that the membership agree uh, to this creation of 650 billion um, equivalent US dollar new money, um, the low income countries, I understand, only have about 3% of the quota of the IMF and so naturally would only get about 3% of that. It yep. creates this potential for, at a time when um, official aid is being cut because the size of many economies is cut and because of austerity uh, on aid budgets, uh, it, it creates this potential for real substantial new money to meet the SDGs, to go back to the connection with your, your paper, which explains how vast that need is. Uh, it, yes, indeed. And uh, I, I do expect that we would see uh, willingness uh, it has been already voiced during the discussions we have had a number of countries, uh, uh, advanced economies and uh, uh, emerging markets like China with strong uh, fundamentals. Uh, they have indicated interest uh, for the fund to come up with proposals once we had the allocation. Uh, so we are looking at a broad range of uh, ideas that have been uh, presented uh, to us. Uh, one that is uh, most viable and uh, likely to be part of that is uh, what we have already done, getting SDRs into the poverty reduction and growth trust of the IMF and then on land from there at highly concessional uh, terms. Uh, one thing that, that is important to uh, recognize is that the great advantage of SDRs is it doesn't cost money to governments because what they are doing is they're giving us their capacity to provide for reserves to share across the membership. Uh, but if we are to be getting money to own land, then there would be questions that we need to answer uh, around risks for those that are on lending and uh, uh, around securing concessionality. Uh, among the other uh, ideas uh, that are coming is how we can make, uh, make it so that perhaps uh, uh, we help uh, the uh, developing uh, countries with other profound challenges like resilience to climate change. Uh, as you know, they are highly vulnerable uh, economies, countries that that may be middle income, but highly vulnerable to climate shocks, could there be a way to help these countries? Uh, and as I said, uh, um, uh, uh, there are also questions around how more broadly SDRs can be an input into the overall objectives of uh, supporting development. Uh, and these would be questions we would be working uh, with the membership uh, very seriously on to stress it is voluntary so it has to be attractive for those that are uh, to be providing this uh, uh, support and it has to be functional it has to do good in the countries uh, that need the uh, the financing uh, and if i may uh, people often say oh it's only three percent yeah it is only three percent but 21 billion is three times more than the debt service suspension initiative provided as fiscal space for low income countries. So in relative terms, it is not a trivial contribution. And I am so, so relieved that the membership decided to go for it. 
Okay. Well, uh, no, it, it's extremely significant and become even more significant if they voluntarily transfer some of it to developing countries. So good luck as you pursue that. Um, and, uh, you know, going back to your SDG paper, it really does require huge extra financing if we're going to get back on track for the for the SDGs. One thing that that's puzzled me that perhaps you can explain to me and participants is why there hasn't been more demand for the funds uh, credit lines, emergency credit lines. I know that mm -hmm. you have lent more rapidly and extraordinary in this time of remote work that your processes have have been sped up and people, board members and staff members around the world have been able to do so much so quickly, totally unprecedented in terms of fund pro, uh, processes and approval ratings. I understand that. But still, it seems that many countries have been reluctant to to borrow more and that they, you know, and the issue of fiscal space is a really pressing one uh, for many countries. Uh, one way I understand that is that we're in a very different world to in previous crises because the private sector is so big, because bilateral lenders, not least China, are so uh, are so big. But is is how how is this going to be resolved? How are countries going to be able to create that and borrow more? Um, and do you think that we need a big a bigger new round of debt relief to make that possible? Uh, first, um, you're absolutely right. This is a very different crisis different in the origins, different in the response. In this crisis, the accommodative monetary policies of advanced economies meant abundance of liquidity and very low interest rates. So countries that have access to markets, quite understandably, go for borrowing from markets rather than uh, coming to the fund. And to be frank, as, a, uh, as an economist, uh, I would say, yeah, that makes rational uh, sense. If you have a relatively diversified economy and you can borrow at 4%, around the same uh, that you would borrow from the fund, uh, the preference to go to markets uh, is, uh, is um, uh, one that uh, makes... Uh, logical sense uh, we have had some uh, countries coming to the fund for precautionary lines of credit uh, they are primarily they're all in latin america countries that very wisely said well if we have the buffer from the fund our borrowing costs would go down and we have more certainty and especially when these are uh, commodity exporters at the time commodity prices went up very good uh, uh, choice so i look at the um, uh, demand with uh, full understanding that it came primarily if not exclusively primarily because they had been countries that could borrow from markets but also borrowed from the fund as a signal to markets uh, that did not have access and do not have access uh, uh, to markets or it is prohibitively expensive. Going forward, uh, one thing I, I keep reminding people, this crisis is not over. And I am much more comfortable having a significant firing power at the IMF as we move to the next uh, stage of the recovery. Why? Because there are risks for emerging markets. One significant risk is good news for many turning into bad news for some. If growth accelerates and it leads to faster withdrawal of policy support and increase of interest rates, especially in the US, that could turn into a big problem for economies that are still on a back footing that are part of this dangerous divergence. They haven't yet recouped growth, but they have to pay more for that, especially when that is high, both, both uh, uh, official and uh, private uh, sector debt. So this risk is still, still there. And secondly, you spoke about uh, debt. Not only debt, deficits have gone up. 
deficits in advanced economies uh, now average 12%, almost 11.7. Deficits in emerging markets average close to 10%. Deficits in low-income countries, 5.5%. This is still to be handled. And if, you, if we are lucky to be on the fast growth path, and by the way, in our paper, one of the main policy uh, uh, objectives is concentrate on growth, growth inducing investments. Uh, we, may be, we may be in a situation when interest rates are still low, growth goes up, deficits and debt can be serviced uh, well. But what if there is another shock? What if something else happens? What if the uh, race between the virus and the vaccines temporarily is won by the virus? Uh, and at that time, I, I, I do believe that having the fund there matters. I would admit for some countries, the so-called stigma <laughs> still holds them back. I do hope that this year where we have demonstrated you can trust the fund to do the right thing. Uh, and to see, see new countries uh, coming to the fund when they need to. On that relief, uh, uh, Ian, I, uh, we, I do believe very strongly that the um, common framework that the G20 adopted is a major step forward. What it does is to bring public and private creditors together on a case-by-case -case basis to bring down debt to sustainable levels. We have three countries that ask for it, Chad, Ethiopia, Zambia. Very important to make progress because that would signal to other countries, if you need it, you can come to the common framework. And we have to think about strengthening that resolution uh, especially knowing that support, policy support has kept bankruptcies low last year, that may not last. And therefore, we have to have good capacity for insolvency and also for sovereign debt uh, resolution continue to improve it. And the fund, of course, uh, is engaged in that. that that's um, very helpful. One, one explanation that you haven't um, mentioned that I've read is that the credit rating agencies are a real problem um, because the threat of downgrading if countries seek debt relief is real and that many have avoided going to the fund because um, or seeking debt relief because they're worried of downgrading. Is that as big a, an issue as, as is made out and should, should something be done about it? We do have the anecdote uh, from Ethiopia. Ethiopia announced uh, uh, that they would like to benefit from the common framework and uh, they were downgraded. Uh, we, we obviously have to respect the independence of rating agencies. Uh, that being uh, said, there is, of course, a need for all of us to assess carefully how this crisis is different and how the response to this crisis has to be uh, different. Uh, and what, uh, what we can do and uh, I, you're right uh, to bring that up. We have to do even more of it, is to continue to analyze and explain what policy action is necessary and why we need to look at debt and deficits everywhere from the prism of this very uh, different crisis. Uh, I also want to say, uh, because this probably is not being said enough, low for longer doesn't mean low forever and deficits at that level are not a healthy thing so now our priority is to go through the crisis actually our priority is to vaccinate everybody everywhere first and foremost and support households and businesses until we get out of it but we also have to think medium term, how we are going to bring debt levels down, deficit levels down. What does it mean for taxation? I'm very encouraged by the conversations around minimal corporate rate tax. Progressivity of taxation has to be looked into. 
So there is work to be to be uh, done on multiple uh, fronts, not uh, not just uh, looking at two, one indicator at one point. The things that's so encouraging as someone who's worked with and observed the fund over many many years is is that um, your pace of acceleration in terms of policy change and thinking about new ideas has really kept with the times in many ways. And I was very struck. Uh, you've talked about inequality, gender, climate, uh, and increasingly. Uh, broad set of issues, but I was very struck by your recent proposal from not you, but your colleagues uh, on a solidarity tax mm -hmm. and um, that you support very much. You've mentioned the corporate higher taxes and uniform corporate taxes in support of the OECD BEPS process, uh, but also higher solidarity tax. Do you want to say something about why you're calling and what, what the solidarity tax means and, and why you're calling for that? Uh, the solidarity tax is not a new idea. It actually has been done in exceptional circumstances. For example, the unification of Germany. Uh, it is a one-off tax on the uh, higher um, incomes and profit that helps to support those that are that find themselves in a very difficult uh, situation uh, both sectors and communities and uh, and individuals uh, we think that in this crisis uh, uh, there is a rationale to think to apply that idea why because parts of the economy are doing extremely well and other parts are sinking contact dependent industries are sinking low-skilled workers, women, young people, much more severely impacted. Whereas the digital economy took off, it's like moving on steroids. And there is some value in thinking whether we can have some support, some solidarity to keep the, not only to help people in the altruistic way, but to keep the productivity of the economy charged uh, up and uh, to keep the social fabric healthier. We talk these days a lot about pent up demand. People save, now they are going to be vaccinated, go out and spend. Possible, true, may even have some impact uh, on temporary impact on inflation. We are not talking ab uh, enough about pent up protests. We know that after a big crisis, some 18 months later, two years later, if inequality is not addressed, it translates into discontent. And this discontent turns into a fertile ground, not only for unproductive use of, of talent, but also for violence, for populism, for things that hurt the uh, economies. Uh, so this is why we we were we looked at it and said, okay, that is uh, of course a, a policy, choice, policy choice of countries, but it should be on the menu. Well, I I mean, for someone who's who's uh, uh, long been supporting that I, I I I cannot applaud you enough and and just to see the transformation of the fund from the fund of the uh, previous century to the fund of fit for twenty first century meeting this pandemic has been very very encouraging. Let's let's go to some of the questions um, that have been posed um, and and one of them which has got um, a lot of votes is about green growth. So uh, one of the things that's that that um, I'm very aware of coming out of the financial crisis is that it led to a very sharp spike in carbon emissions as the big fiscal stimulus was spent on heavy carbon emission areas, not least infrastructure, cement um, and investment. Could you say something about um, how the fund sees uh, green growth, reconciles sustainable and development? And what you are thinking about is how the fiscal stimulus that you design uh, might also meet, in addition to post-pandemic, uh, climate change objectives. Uh, I'm adding my vote to those for this question. It's a great question. Uh, we, uh, we recognize that uh, before we got into the pandemic, there were problems 
hanging over our heads. And the climate crisis was one of uh, them. It has gone nowhere. If anything, we see the evidence uh, that uh, the urgency to act is, uh, is, is absolutely pressing. What we look at is, can we combine support for exiting uh, the um, uh, economic crisis from the pandemic with the shift to green growth? And the answer is yes. And what we what we uh, uh, propose is a uh, uh, is based on three pillars: one, carbon price. We have to price carbon to create an incentive for low carbon intensity of our economies, and provide forward guidance how this price is going to gradually go up. Today, only 23% of emissions are being covered by some form of carbon price, either tax or trade. But the good news is that it is 5% more than last year. So there is some, some movement in that, in that direction. Second, green infrastructure push, meaning uh, clear, uh, green mobility, uh, you know, electrical mobility, build the charging stations that would give an impetus to shift from um, um, the vehicles of the 20th century to those of the 21st, mobility of 21st, and of course, look at uh, 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 trains and uh, other ways of transportation. Uh, get the massive investment in reducing the uh, carbon intensity of our living and working uh, quarters, because buildings are a massive contributor. So bringing down uh, inefficiency, uh, insulation, moving to to construction that naturally reduce uh, energy consumption, hugely important. Renewable energy on a massive scale. It is unforgivable to have countries with plenty of sunshine and very little solar. How could that be? I used to live in Brussels. Brussels, I can tell you, is not a sunny place. But there was an incentive program for people to put... Uh, uh, solar on their roofs and you drive in, go around in Brussels, there is solar. And then I go to Indonesia or to, to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and it's limited. That has to be changed uh, uh, dramatically and fast. Uh, and then, of course, looking at uh, how we make our life, uh, uh, agriculture, huge opportunities for the reducing uh, um, carbon emissions from there, reforestations, mangrove restoration, land restoration. There is so much we can do that creates jobs, creates growth opportunities, and makes us more resilient to climate change. And the third pillar, just transition. We will fail if we don't take care of the people and the businesses that are affected by this transition. So how we use public support, including from uh, if we generate money from carbon price to help people and communities and businesses to adapt, uh, that would make a huge difference. Uh, so uh, where are we today? The first round of uh, uh, fiscal st uh, stimulus was not fantastic. We calculated that only around 5% went into that direction. But now we see massive increase in the European Union with the uh, new generation EU, uh, in the United States with the proposed infrastructure uh, package, in China, across the world. I think uh, the more we equip policymakers with this right policies to move, the better, because the next couple of years are going to make it or not. <laughs> and I'm... Uh, Ian, I'm, I'm ultimately the, the optimist. We are going to make it. Well, uh, <laughs> we certainly have to. The options uh, of not making it are so terrible. But um, the IMF, obviously, and you have a, a critical role to play. And uh, thank you for that. And I think it also addresses uh, another question which is coming, which is, uh, are sustainable and development incompatible? And I think you've demonstrated how they can be made compatible. Another question is on tax avoidance and ev evasion. Uh, it says putting an end to tax avoidance and evasion is critical to achieve the SDGs. 
what is the IMF doing to support this? And do you support a minimum corporation tax of 25%, automatic exchange of information, uh, and other similar related initiatives? For, for quite some time, the fund has been very supportive of a uh, uh, uniform corporate tax to reduce tax avoidance. And within countries, a big chunk of the work we do in policy support and capacity development is to strengthen tax administrations so they can collect uh, taxes, they can, they, they can uh, impose the right taxes and then collect uh, tax revenues uh, effectively. We just published a book. It is on that topic of tax. And it basically says um, uh, very simply, the um, taxing is as old as civilization as is the attempt to avoid paying taxes. So we are going to be uh, always in this uh, conundrum of um, businesses and people trying to uh, sneak through and pay less taxes. Uh, how that can be addressed? Uh, transparency. We are very much in favor of as much use of digital technologies to make the invisible <laughs> visible. How much is the, your income? How much is your tax obligation? And you pay that. Uh, but also simplification. We have seen one of the big sources of tax avoidance is complicated tax codes. So the more we can move in that direction, uniform taxation, so there is no race to the bottom, transparency, tax transparency, income tra tra transparency, and simplification, and then learn from each other uh, because what I learned uh, in my in my experience is that very often the uh, the um, tax road is uh, paved with good intentions that cause trouble. Uh, the book I mentioned uh, uh, has one very um, interesting um, um, anecdote from the UK when the in the 18th, 18th century tax was put on windows. Why? So tax inspectors don't bother families to go in. But then what happened was people started uh, breaking their windows and the tax became hated because they ended up with no light and no clean air, maybe paying less taxes. So we have to always, in this tax discussion, always also think of the law of unintended consequences. Uh, and this is why I, I, I emphasize uh, this learning from uh, from each other as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, clearly an area where there's huge need for cooperation uh, and shared learning, but amazing progress being made uh, in recent months, um, not least by the US in, in this regard. So it's encouraging. Um, a question which has received uh, many votes is what is the role of uh, global institutions in job creation for sustainable development. And I know the fund has written about um, the, the multipliers in job creation from fiscal stimulus and from other actions, but um, how would you respond to, to this question? Uh, specifically for the IMF, uh, we have three very important... And if you feel qualified to answer for other global institutions. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> but obviously global institutions uh, bring two very important uh, pieces of answering this question. The one is sharing experience. I cannot overstate this transmission line role that global institutions play to learn best practice and to avoid worse mistakes. And then, of course, secondly, a huge role to finance sustainable development that creates well-paying jobs. Uh, and uh, for, the, for us at the fund, uh, that what this means is, one, we have a very unique function. It is called surveillance. For those who may not know what it is, we are like uh, a doctor that takes the vital signs of individual countries to make sure the world economy, that countries are healthy and the world economy is healthy. So we have 
individual country surveillance, we do it regularly, and we have global surveillance. Why is this important for the, uh, the uh, question you ask? Because of this transmission line, but also uh, because of detecting uh, problems like wasteful uh, spending or uh, insufficient uh, collection of, pu of uh, public revenues or very bad uh, problems uh, in policy terms that, that stop private investment for, for investing, because in the end, most jobs are created by private sector. In developing countries, 90% uh, of jobs are created by, by private sector. Uh, so we do that. And uh, secondly, we, we do support countries uh, uh, that uh, are faced with difficulties uh, to come up with, uh, with good policy packages. And we are now much more mindful that growth and jobs are hugely important and that you can only have high productivity in jobs if there are strong investments in human capital. I cannot repeat this enough. So what the fund has adopted is what we call social spending floors. We were often criticized that we go and say to countries, cut, 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 your budgets are blown up, cut. Uh, now we are saying, yeah, be efficient, improve efficiency, but protect education, protect health, protect social protection, uh, social uh, uh, safety nets, uh, protect investment in people. Uh, and the third thing we do is capacity development. Uh, we do a lot of work with, with uh, public authorities primarily, but also with private institutions uh, around, uh, again, best practice uh, experience, uh, so they can they can actually go in that in that direction. We pay much more attention on employment than we used to used to do, because exactly of the context uh, of your question, it is uh, uh, critical for social sustainability uh, to have people uh, with meaningful meaningful. Uh, jobs yeah uh, and uh i mean it's, it's so interesting to observe the funds evolution over the years you know talking about sdgs talking about jobs inequality gender and all these issues because they are so vital uh as you you now recognize for for the viability of growth and the economies uh, but uh huge huge evolution in that and i think also the point you make about learning by throwing the spotlight on mistakes, uh, one learns faster than if one only uh, talks about success. And I think that evaluation capacity has also strengthened in enormously. I think the final question we'll have time for is um, regarding resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is that um, the concept has not really been applied across the SDGs uh, in all the goals and targets. And given the pandemic, uh, should we be thinking more about resilience uh, in economies and how would um, one do this in terms of embedding them in the SDGs and in programs? Uh, one of my uh, most uh, impactful uh, parts in my professional life was to be for five years a uh, humanitarian and crisis response commissioner with a front seat in the most dramatic shocks hitting communities and countries uh, from the uh, earthquake in Haiti to the uh, uh, Great East Japan uh, earthquake to floods in Pakistan to the war in Syria. And uh, what I learned in this painful engagement with people was very simple that resilience of people, of communities, is paramount in a shock-prone world. And that we have to change our mindset to integrate in a very holistic way that concept of resilience. And what it, if we go back after 2009, the uh, global financial crisis, the world concentrated on the resilience of the banking sector. And a lot of good work was done. 
So now we are in this crisis, we don't have a banking uh, crisis. But this is very narrow. This pandemic tells us that we have to expand this concept of resilience and think about resilient people. And again, I'm repeating myself, but people that are educated, that are healthy, that are operating in a healthy social fabric of their communities. We need a resilient planet. We cannot anymore function as if natural resources are in, unlimited. They're not. And we need more broadly resilient economies in which we do work on strong fundamentals where we think about buffers so we are better prepared uh, for shocks. But we also think about the fairness of these economies, the inclusiveness of what we achieve. We are fantastic. We are so creative. And the majority of people on this planet are actually very good people. They do want to help others. We have to use that social unity much more. Uh, and again, Ian, if you allow me, I would finish with one of the big lessons I learned in these five years, that goodness is very quiet. Hate, very loud. And so how, how we can get to amplify these voices of, of solidarity and inclusion, uh, this is for all of us. And I take it is part of my job to loudly speak about it uh, from the position I currently hold. And it's often said, uh, for bad to triumph only requires that good stays silent um, and stares on the sidelines. So uh, absolutely, and I think those lessons on resilience are, are, are very poignant. And as we think about them, obviously, we, we think um, of the tragic situation unfolding in India and the terrible suffering uh, that's happening there and in many places around the world that I'm sure participants in this uh, webinar uh, are from and, and our heart goes out to them. Uh, we need to do more and we need to do more more urgently, but also learn from this crisis. Um, that is the, the topic of rescue, which I'll be discussing on a webinar on the 19th of May at 5 p.m. if you're interested. Um, we also have started in the Oxford Martin School a new research program uh, on the future of development. I have eight vacancies out. So those of you with doctorates or close to doctorates uh, that would be interested in working uh, in Oxford, have a look at the Oxford Martin School's website uh, vacancies page. Uh, for that, the closing date is the 12th of May uh, for those positions. And we're trying to think about the issues that we've been discussing today going forward in a positive way. It's been a treat to have uh, Kristalina Gorgieva with us. Um, your time is precious. You need to get on with that SDR and many other agendas. Uh, but we hope that uh, you found it as worthwhile as I'm sure all the participants have. And thank you for your very frank and open way of discussing my sometimes difficult questions. Um, but it is, I think, very much part of the new fund uh, sharing ideas. And certainly the paper that you've launched today uh, is a, a key key part of that. So thank you so much, uh, Kristalina. Wonderful to see you. And um, to all the participants, I hope you stay in health uh, and that you take to heart some of the messages that Kristalina's shared uh, and they help you uh, in your work as you go forward. Thanks to all of you. And thank, you. thank you. Bye. Thank you.